Mr. Uh, Bert Mustin is with us again tonight. Bert is, uh, Bert Mustin is kind of our resident nonogenarian, which means he is octogenarian, he's 80. Nonogenarian, as you know, is 90 years old. Uh, still active in his career. He's uh, been uh, on The Tonight Show three or four times. Just completed a movie for Disney called The Strongest Man in the World, and is currently, believe it or not, at his age, working on a comedy series for 1975 called Love Nest. He's only appeared in something like 300 television uh, shows, and I don't know how many movies. Would you welcome Mr. Burt Mustin? <laughs> Nice to see you again. Oh, nice to be back again, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you killed them last time when you were here. You did a number uh, from 1900 and something uh, that you'd remember, that one of the first numbers you ever sang, and he got up and sang in front of this audience and fractured them. Well, yeah. I've got an even, even older one than that to inflict upon them this year. You have an older number to do tonight? Yeah. yeah. What year did you first come out here to Hollywood? Uh, my first visit to Hollywood was in 1925. I came out. Uh, from Pittsburgh with the Pittsburgh Lions Quartet to compete in the uh, quartet contest. Oh, Pittsburgh. Uh, compete in the quartet contest in San Francisco. And then, of course, we had to come down here to see Hollywood. Right. And uh, we were met by the Lions Clubs. It had a very enjoyable time here. And, of course, we had to see uh, something of the, of, of the movie people. And in those days, there were no studio tours at all, you know. So the best you could hope for was to go out to Beverly Hills, where all the big stars lived, and uh, take one of the uh, tours that they right. had there in, in, in these Fifth Avenue-type buses, you know. Uh, right. the, the, everybody sitting up on the top seat there, and they had the guy with the megaphone to uh, give you all the celebrities. So I, of course, went along on one of those. and. Uh, this man was telebiting all about the wonderful things in Hollywood. He said, now, ladies and gentlemen, we are approaching on our left the famous Barrymore Mansion. And the little 17-year-old girl in the front row said, oh, you mean Jack Barrymore? He said, no, madam, I don't. I mean Lionel Barrymore, his brother. I see. And now, ladies and gentlemen, on the right, we are coming to the famous Pickford residence. Oh, you mean Mary Pickford? She said, no, madam, I don't. I mean Jack Pickford, her brother. A little while later, and now we're coming to the famous Fairbanks mansion. <gasps> you mean Douglas Fairbanks? He said, no, madam, I don't. I mean Douglas Fairbanks Jr., his son. Well, by that time, she was just about crushed, and he was pretty exasperated with her. So and now, ladies and gentlemen, we are approaching our newest and finest edifice in, Be in Beverly Hills. This is the Christ Methodist Episcopal Church. <laughs> and he glared down at the little gal, and she never said a word, but a drunk in the back of the bus said, go ahead and ask him, lady. You can't be wrong all <laughs> That's why they... You know what I say? You, your first... In 1925, you were in your 40s yes. in 1925. Yes. No, but you hadn't even considered an acting career. You told me once on the show that you didn't actually start as a professional actor until you were your 60s or your early 70s. Uh, I was 60, 67 when I act, turned pro. I'd hammed it all my life in Pittsburgh and Tucson, and done everything in the way of it. But I never had the slightest aspiration to go on the stage because even if you were reasonably successful, the best you could hope for was a run in New York and then uh, living in uh, hotels all over the United right. States. Well, I had a little home-loving wife that that wouldn't have suited at all, and we had decided that before we were married. She said, if you want to you have that kind of a life, you better get yourself another girl. So I wanted the girl rather than the life, and I never gave it any thought until I had a chance to come out here to Hollywood where I could be home and right. still have the little cottage and the green thumb that she loved and adored. So what was the first thing you did in Joe, professionally out here? Was it a uh, motion picture or a television? Yes, detective mm -hmm. story. Right. I went over from Tucson to play the play in uh, Sombrero Theater, and uh, Willie Wilder came over to see Kirk Douglas in action. He liked what I did well enough to give me the role in the picture, and I've been here ever since. Do they ever ask you to play a part older than you are? Yes, I play parts anywhere from 60 to 105. I'm getting a smile from this lady because I remember one time uh, in, with her, I played the superannuated uh, butler for Reggie, uh, Reginald Owens, and uh, after welcoming her and her husband, Jim Garner, at the door, I was just barely able to make the dining room staggering down in front of them. But now, the way I, uh, the way I would transform myself 
from what I am normally, you know, that would be to kind of screw up my face a little, well, a little bit, to get a high voice and you can rage in a hurry, I'm telling you. I'm <laughs> Kills me a 90-year-old man trying to do an old man, huh? Well... <laughs> and, you, and you got to work to play it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lear had a lot of fun with the audience when I did that role in All, in All in the Family as the old guy in the blue pajamas that I imagine most of the folks here saw. Right. And uh, when he introduced me to the audience, he said, you know, uh, when I called Bert in to do this job, I explained to him that I wanted him to play the part of an 83-year-old man. So I suggested that he go out and sit in MacArthur Park and watch how old people behave themselves. Yeah, you, you'd have to do it also. You don't, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't, are you conscious of that? that you know, most people would so get depressed, you know, because they're getting long in life. But 90 years old, you, I, I get the feeling you don't think that at all or feel that way. Well, when you, when you, you, you get used to it, it comes on you so gradually. Uh -huh. But... Uh, <laughs> 90 just kind of creeps yeah, up on you, huh? 90 just creeps up on you. And I, uh, I, I try to kid myself that my talking voice and my singing voice is still a masterful, virile voice. And then I hear myself on the playback, and I know the old guy's wobbling. <laughs> <laughs> Quit playing that old man, Bert. It'll never work. Then when I go back to Pittsburgh and see all the old fellas that I was br brought up with and see how much they've aged, I yeah. know something has happened. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to take a short break, then we'll come back and you'll do this song that's even older than the one... Even older than that one, yes. All right, we'll be right back after this brief pause. <laughs> Bird hasn't told me the name of the song or what year uh, this comes from, but uh, I think there's a little uh, background to it. Uh, Bert, you want to tell him about it? Yeah. The, this song I'm going to sing is a, is a real genuine oldie. It's the oldest song I ever, ever knew. And as a 10-year-old boy at Chautauqua Lake in New York, they attended a homegrown musical show there, a minstrel show, and a man came out with a banjo and accompanied himself with this song. And I liked it so much that I went back for the second show. It goes all the way, it was, uh, uh, bear in mind, that's 80 years ago, and the song was old then. It goes all back to the days of the, the wood fire, the kerosene lamp, and the electric uh, lamp, and the electric light in its infancy. So that's the story. Jim Brown has just been married. He's got a lovely spouse. She said she'd do the cooking when they were keeping house. She cooked a lovely supper of vegetables and meat. He tried it, then he told her it wasn't fit to eat. Girl wanted, girl wanted. Next day the sign appeared upon the door. Girl wanted, girl wanted. And wifey isn't cooking anymore. She said it was like mother used to make it. He told her if it was, she'd have to shake it. So at the break of day, those a chance to pass that way saw the sign the girl wanted. The first girl was a pretty girl of handsome form and face. Brown liked her looks, and so, of course, the girl secured the place. But wifey, she was jealous. She thought something amiss. She watched and saw her husband give that pretty girl a kiss. Girl wanted. Girl wanted. Next day the sign appeared upon the door. The girl wanted. Girl wanted. That pretty girl ain't working anymore. You ought to see that pretty girl skedaddle. Brown got a bloody nose in the battle. So at the break of day, those the chance to pass that way saw the sign. Girl wanted. The next girl was a country girl. Her face would give one frights. She lost her breath in trying to blow out the electric lights. One day she tried to light the fire. The wood was somewhat green. When just to see if it would help, she poured on kerosene. Oh, girl wanted, girl wanted. Next day the sign appeared upon the door. Girl wanted, girl wanted. That country girl ain't working anymore. And now she's working up a little higher. No more she has to monkey 
with a fire. So at the break of day, those that chanced to pass that way saw the sign. I'll tell you something, if we're ever at a benefit, where there's one of those charity things, there are a lot of performers, I don't want to follow you, ever. <laughs> ever, because... Uh, I don't want to follow you. You're a tough actor. <laughs> I don't want to follow you. <laughs>